Good evening. This special meeting of the Baltimore City Council Committee to hold is now called to order. Please turn off all cell phones or put them on vibrate. Before we proceed, it's important that we first respect one of the council's oldest customs by opening our proceedings with a prayer. Today, we are honored to have Rabbi uh, Tannenbaum, Director of the Jewish Uniform Service Association of Maryland and of Shabbat of Maryland to lead us in our invocation. Almighty God, Master of the Universe, look favorably upon the Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council of our great city of Baltimore. We beseech you, Almighty and merciful God, to extend your grace to each and every member of this august body and bestow upon them joy of life, good health, and prosperity. In just a few weeks, we'll be celebrating the Jewish holiday of Passover, a holiday that celebrates the freedom of the Jewish people from 210 years of harsh slavery in Egypt. The Jewish people then stood before Mount Sinai to accept the laws which will guide them as a nation and be a light unto all nations. We beseech you, God Almighty, in prayer to give strength to those assembled here today to govern this blessed city of Baltimore, ensuring a freedom for all people guided by the constitutional laws and social order. May our city serve as a beacon of light for people of all faiths and all walks of life. We also ask of you, God, to protect and watch over all of the law enforcement and public safety officers who put their lives on the line every day. I'd like to end off with a verse from the book of Job in the original Hebrew text, O seh shalom bim ramav, hu yaaseh shalom aleinu, v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. In translation, he who makes peace on high, may he bring peace upon us and upon all of humanity, and let us say amen. Amen. Uh, please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing, re remain standing for the National Anthem, which will be performed this afternoon by Ms. Leah Lynch. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Rabbi. Oh. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets reckless the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the Great job, Lear. The clerk will call the roll of the members. President Young, Kraft, Scott, Curran, Henry Spector, Middleton Mosby, Holton Welsh, Rossier, Costello, Stokes, Branch Clark. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. We are fortunate to have a number of dignitaries who have joined us this afternoon. I will ask Council Vice President Ed Reisinger to recognize them at this time. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, those in attendance, please stand as I call your name and remain standing. Delegate Kurt Anderson, Delegate Jill Carter, Delegate Antonio Hayes, Delegate Talmadge Branch, Senator Nathaniel McFadden, former State Senator Larry Young, Controller Joan Pratt, 
State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby, Sheriff John Anderson, Judge Michael Pearson, Michael Campbell of the Baltimore Fire's Officers, Jerome Stevens representing Senator Ben Cardin, George Pleasant Jones representing Congressman Dutch Rupersberger, Bridget Smith representing Congressman John Sarbanes, and Gene Hathaway representing Governor Hogan. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And, and Mr. President, we also have Belinda Condaway from the Resident of Wills. Oh, thank you. Welcome back home, Belinda. I want to welcome um, all of you to City Hall, but especially welcome my colleague, um, Belinda Conway, who um, now serves as the Register of Wills. Welcome back home. Okay. Um, at this time, we will have Iman Hassan Amin, the Islamic chaplain of John Hopkins University, to lead us in prayer. You want us to stand, Iman? Okay. Our Lord says, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other, not despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is he who is the most righteous of you. And Allah has full knowledge and well acquainted with all things. Our Lord, let us be amongst the righteous and amongst those who are compassionate towards others. Let us be amongst those who show kindness towards others. Let us be amongst those who show mercy towards others. Let us care about others instead of just caring about ourselves. Let jealousy and envy of others leave our hearts. Let us be amongst those that are at the forefront of helping others, no matter what race, gender, disability, social status, or religious affiliation. Let us, let us treat others in a respectful and caring way, the way we want others to treat us. Let Baltimore show in its action a city of compassion. I mean. Man. Thank you, Ima. I will now formally appoint and dispatch a group of members to escort the mayor into the chambers. The members of the escort committee are Councilwoman Rochelle Ricky Spector, Councilman Robert Kern, Councilwoman Helen Holton, and Councilman Pete Welch. Will the escort committee please greet the mayor and accompany her to the chambers? I ask that the members of the audience to please remain seated and hold your applause until the chief clerk has introduced our mayor. I want to recognize um, Michelle Brown, who's representing U.S. Senator Barbara Mikulski. Where is he? Oh. And um, I also want to recognize our former uh, councilman, Bill Cole. Welcome back home, Bill. <laughs> I, didn't see, I didn't see you over there, Bill. <laughs> Anybody else, former?
Thank you so much. Uh-oh, am I on? Yes. Madam Mayor, <laughs> members of the council and honorable guests, I have the high privilege of honor of presenting to you the mayor of the great city of Baltimore, the Honorable Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all so very much. Mr. President, members of the city, members of the city council, Madam Comptroller, friends and colleagues in government, faithful clergy, and committed citizens of Baltimore City. Thank you for the opportunity to report to you on the state of our city as we work together to grow Baltimore. I want to recognize a few special people. I know that without their help, their love, and their support, I could not juggle the duties of being mayor with the responsibilities of being a mother and a wife. As a mother of an 11-year-old, I, like many other working parents in this room, often look to my family for help. I want to thank my husband, Kent, and my mother, and my entire family. Yes, Mom, yes, you. This is your, your moment in the spotlight. I want to thank my mother and my entire family for all that you do every day. I was born and raised in Baltimore. I am a Baltimore girl through and through. My mother's from the east side. She graduated from Dunbar. My father's from the west side. He grew up in Poe Homes and graduated from Douglas. I'm a very, very proud graduate of Western High School. Thank you very much, fellow doves in the room. Anytime you have an opportunity where leadership is convened, there's always a few doves in the room. So I am very proud that my daughter attends Baltimore City Public Schools as well. I love this city. I love peppermint sticks at the flower mart. I love egg custard snowballs, extra marshmallow, Lake Montebello, Drood Hill Park, taking my daughter ice skating at Mima de Petro Ice Rink. I like the rhythm of the crowd at the African American Festival, the pageantry of Hunfest, and a few Black Eyed Susans at Preakness. But you know what I really love about Baltimore? The people. The people of our city have heart, passion, and determination. I would say we have grit. When the British invaded, we fought and we won. When the great fire burned our city, we rebuilt. And after decades of decline and flight from our city, today we grow. We're scrappy, we're resilient, we're proud. And whenever anyone tries to count Baltimore out, we prove them wrong. That's why I'm honored. That's why I'm honored to serve as your mayor. In my inaugural address, it was a time for us to be bold. I laid out that challenge to focus on growing Baltimore. I wanted not only to attract new families, but to improve the quality of life for those already here. And we're doing great things in Baltimore. No one can deny that we've turned a corner. New families, new millennials, and new companies are increasingly choosing to make Baltimore their home, and more are choosing to stay. For the first time in decades, our city is growing. We know that Baltimore is great, but just listen to what others are saying about us. We are a city of innovators. Both Poplar Mechanics and Consumer Reports rank our city as one of the nation's best for startups. We are a smart city. Forbes magazine ranks us as the sixth smartest city in America. We've been described as a cool city for millennials. We have the fourth fourth fastest growing uh, population for that demographic. We are a, a city with great history, arts, and culture. USA says we're the home to one of the best city arts districts in America. Shout out to Station North. And Fort McHenry ranks as one of the city's best national monuments. Well, the country's best next national monuments, excuse me. We are a city of outstanding colleges and universities. We are home to the best hospitals in the world. 
Patients travel from all corners of the globe for treatment at Johns Hopkins. The University of Maryland sets the standard for world-class trauma care. We are a strong city, but like every other city across the country, we have challenges. From the beginning, I made it clear I would not leave our toughest issues for other electeds to solve or pass along inevitable doomsday crises to our children. Instead, we chose a different path. We reformed pensions. We began a path towards a 10-year financial plan, giving us an opportunity over a reasonable period of time to fix our long-term structural deficit while protecting our shared priorities. In July, Standard & Poor's upgraded the city's credit rating to AA, affirming that we are on the right fiscal path. Coupled with that same rating from Moody's, this represents the highest combined rating for Baltimore City from both agencies in more than 50 years. I was waiting for you to stand up on that one, Henry. Over the long term, this will save taxpayers millions of dollars on construction projects like schools, roads, and recreation centers. And I, can, I intend to continue making decisions that will maintain our long-term fiscal stability. As we took on these huge financial challenges, we moved ahead with our promise to reduce the city's residential property tax rate. Whether you are a first-time home buyer, a growing family, or a lifelong resident, I want you to stay in Baltimore. Since I introduced my plan to reduce the property tax rate for homeowners 20 cents by 2020, I've been working responsibly and steadily to provide real tax relief. That's why when I announce next year's budget proposal, I will deliver yet another cut making a reduction of about 14 cents since I took office. I promised that I would reduce property tax rates, and that's a promise that I'm keeping. In addition to creating a solid financial foundation for our city to grow, our top priority has been making our city safer. First and foremost, we must thank the men and women who selflessly risk their lives to protect the citizens of, our, of Baltimore City each and every day they show up for work. We're reminded of their sacrifices this year with the tragic deaths of Police Officer Craig Chandler and Fire Lieutenant James Bathia. I would like all of us to take a moment of silence for our fallen heroes. Thank you. Under the leadership of Police Commissioner Batts, in 2014, we made progress in our ongoing fight to make our streets safer. Last year, we experienced declines in every major crime category, including a 10% decline in homicides, resulting in the second lowest number of homicides in a generation. I'm encouraged by our progress, but I'm still not satisfied. One victim is too many. One life is too many. And one senseless tragedy is more than any of us should bear. I know because I, too, have been there. We know a more proactive police department will ensure that, more, that, that fewer families feel that pain. People in Baltimore want to see more police on the streets. So last month, we launched a new system of scheduling our patrol officers. This new schedule is expected to produce real results for our residents, more officers during peak times, and faster response to citizen calls. This change was accomplished in partnership with the Fraternal Order of Police, and I want to thank the FOP President, Gene Ryan, for working with us. In addition to seeing more police on the streets, residents often tell me that they want to know the officers in their community. And just as important, our officers should know the people they are sworn to protect. We now have foot officers walking communities throughout our city every single day. We can clap for that, that's good. 
Additionally, we've continued our focus, our intense focus, on repeat violent offenders. With our partners at the federal level, we put nearly 90 members of a gang organization in federal prison with enhanced sentences. Meanwhile, the department's Operation Ceasefire led to a 45% reduction in homicides in the Western District. And this year, we are expanding Operation Ceasefire to the Eastern District. I want to thank our new state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby. She has hit the ground running in her first few months in office, not that there was an option. You had to hit the ground running and you were doing it well. I welcome her to our fight against repeat violent offenders and I look forward to our partnership producing results for the citizens of Baltimore. We've also seen tremendous gains in fire safety thanks to the hard work of Chief Ford and the men and women of our fire department. With their efforts, we have sustained reductions in fire-related deaths and improved EMS response times. I want to thank the presidents of our fire unions, Rick Hoffman and Mike Campbell. I know one of them is here. Mike, thank you for being here. Now, thank you both for working with us on a new contract that has enabled sub, uh, substantive changes in scheduling and an overall reduction in overtime spending. Thank you. Our public, our public safety efforts are more effective and more efficient, but we have not stopped here. We have been actively working to improve community trust while, producing, while also producing real results for our citizens. Citizen complaints alleging excessive force are down 46%. Police discourtesy complaints are down 53%. Notice of lawsuits alleging police misconduct are down dramatically over the past three years. And we know the overwhelming majority of our offices treat our residents with dignity, with respect and courtesy. They wear the badge with honor and demonstrate reverence for the position they hold in our community. However, it only takes a few bad actors to damage the reputation of the entire city. Over the past nine months, over the past year, excuse me, we've held nine public safety forums where Commissioner Batts and I heard from residents who called on us to do more. And to that end, we are working to bring body cameras to the police department. As many of you know, the Body Camera Working Group presented its findings last month. They recommended a pilot program with specific policy proposals to ensure that we incorporate this technology in a way that builds community trust while protecting the privacy rights of our citizens. The pilot program will be in place later this year. By taking the time to evaluate the different technology options and work through operational logistics, our police department can become a national leader in the use and implementation of police body cameras. <laughs> Additionally, we are working very hard to make reforms to the statewide laws governing police misconduct. The improvements that we've proposed to the Law Enforcement Officers' Bill of Rights were inspired by our conversations with community leaders, and they offer an important step towards enhancing public trust. This is just one example of my administration's broader initiative to rebuild public trust in local government. We're now posting details of legal settlements of alleged police misconduct on our law department's website. And in order to do a better job of rooting out fraud and corruption in city government, I have more than doubled the budget for, and staff for the Office of the Inspector General. General. Additionally, we work with the city's delegation in Annapolis to bring real change and accountability as well as transparency to the Liquor Board. The Board is providing better enforcement of our laws, our rules, and our regulations in a manner that is more responsive to our neighborhoods. I also created the city's Billing Integrity Unit soon after I became mayor and, it, and doubled its staff this past year. We are seeing real results. By correcting mistakes that led to excess, excessive charges to homeowners and businesses, as well as closing loopholes exploited by some to avoid taxes and fees, the Billing Integrity Unit has had a $15 million impact for taxpayers.
I know how hard you work to pay your fair share. I pledge to go after those who don't, and I'm delivering. We know that there can be no public trust without public engagement. We show anger over police misconduct, but far too often, we ignore something that should prompt just as much outrage. Of the 211 tragic killings in our city last year, 189 were African American men. 189. We need to end the violence in our communities. This year on Martin Luther King Day, I, along with many of you, joined a local conversation in support of President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative. There was passion and a determination to do more by everyone in the room. I promise to do more. Our African American men need to believe in their future. As many of you know, several years ago, my brother Wendell was a victim of a carjacking. He was nearly killed in front of the home where I currently live. After the attack, he told me that as a black man, he felt really bad when he hesitated to get out of his car and looked at the two young black men, both under 16, with suspicion, immediately thinking they must be up to no good. But he continued to my front door. They followed him and attacked him with a sword almost decapitating him. Thankfully, by the grace of God, and unlike many other victims of violent crime, my brother lived. And I'm humbled by the conviction and the sense of purpose that he demonstrated after the attack. He worked at a not-for-profit for several years, developing after-school programs, serving as a mentor to many young people, and working in several recreation centers throughout the city. He continues the relationship with his mentees to this day. He, along with many other black men in our community, inspire me. I'm announcing the start of an intense focus on our African-American young men. At the end of this month, I will bring together community leaders and experts for a call to action to end African-American homicides. I want to thank Reverend Jamal Harrison Bryan for serving as our moderator for this inaugural forum. Through this call to action, we will recruit men committed to making a difference in the lives of our children, to serve as mentors, volunteers, tutors, job training coaches, speakers, and more. We will reach out to organizations who are already working on this issue, and we will encourage others to join. We will not do it alone. We cannot do it alone. And most importantly, we cannot afford to fail. As we focus on the youth of our city, we know that growing Baltimore means creating more recreation opportunities for them. Our young people must be kept safe and engaged. Before I came into office, the city was closing recreation centers without any substantive plan for how to fill in the gaps. I knew that we could do better. In Morrill Park, we opened the city's first newly constructed recreation center in nearly a decade. In Clifton Park, we renovated and expanded the Rita Church Center, and we're now building a new gym. In Park Heights, we're expanding C.C. Jackson to complement the new athletic fields. Additionally, in Cherry Hill and Cahill, we are set to break ground on new recreation centers later this year. But if we really care about quality recreation for our kids, we need access to more funding. That's why my administration has put forward a proposal to sell a few downtown garages and use that money to build recreation centers. <laughs> now, 
Members of the council, I call on you to bring my plan forward. We all agree that our children deserve better. This bill deserves a hearing. This work will complement the most significant school construction effort in our city's history. The nearly $1 billion investment will make major improvements to our school buildings, which are the oldest in the state. The success of our schools is measured not solely by the quality of the buildings, but more importantly, by the achievements of our children and our students, of our teachers in the classroom. And we are seeing real success. Children enrolled in our Head Start programs have improved school readiness up 11 percentage points in the past three years. More students are graduating from our high schools, while the city's dropout rate has declined more than 50 percent over the past five years. Overall, enrollment is up and our public charter schools are in high demand. More families have confidence in the quality of our schools. This is critical if we are going to continue to grow. I would like to take a moment to thank and recognize our school CEO, Dr. Gregory Thornton, for his work during his first nine months here in Baltimore. You have been a great partner. And while we've made major gains, the school system is facing serious challenges. Like many of you, I am deeply troubled by the proposed state cuts in funding to our city schools. Yes, I realize that our schools face their own budget challenges that must be addressed. But the state should not compound the problem with additional cuts. Like our governor, I encountered significant budget challenges when I first took office. But I set priorities and made sure that they were protected. We cannot allow the state to balance its budget at the expense of our children's future. We must protect the progress that we've made and I pledge to continue my work with my partners in Annapolis to protect funding for Baltimore City Schools. As we focus on educating our children, we must also focus on our children's health and their well-being. That's why I'm so proud of the Be More for Healthy Babies initiative. Since 2010, we have seen a 24% decline in our infant mortality rate in Baltimore City, as well as a 30, we can clap for that, yes. I have one more for you, a 32% decline in our teen birth rate. Under the leadership of our new health commissioner, Dr. Lena Wen, we will expand the Healthy Babies Initiative to school-age children. In the coming months, we will launch our Be More for Healthy Kids and our Be More for Healthy Teens Initiative. We will focus on nutrition, on exercise, and the unmet health care needs of our children. Dr. Wen knows a growing city must be a healthy city. She's already brought together our city's pediatric leaders in support of measles vaccinations. She's also set an aggressive agenda focused on addiction and preventing overdose fatalities in our city. Together, we will implement the findings from my Heroin Treatment and Prevention Task Force, which, we, which will be released by the summer. Baltimore has been an innovator in many areas in public health, and we look forward to sharing our successes with the rest of Maryland and the rest of our nation. Thank you. We're not only growing our city by improving the health of our residents, but together we're growing Baltimore by making our city cleaner. Last summer we launched our municipal trash can pilot program and it's already showing positive results. We're also replacing our older street sweepers, and for the first time, we've added mechanical alley sweeping to almost a dozen neighborhoods every week. Only the neighborhoods that get them are clapping right now, so we'll clap for that. 
<laughs> we have nearly doubled the number of workers in our rat abatement program, allowing us to implement a systemic, robust rat control strategy for our neighborhoods, as opposed to simply responding to complaints. We're also investing in sustainable transportation efforts. The Planning Commission will vote on the city's bike master plan later this month. This plan establishes an expansion of our bike route network to create a more bike-friendly city. To help guide our efforts, I will issue an executive order establishing a mayor's bike advisory commission later this month. And I will continue to fight this session in Annapolis to move the red line forward. The business community. The business community and our anchor institutions made a very public expression of support for the red line this winter. They know how transformative the red line will be for growth and economic development in our city. Our Senator Barb says it best. The red line is a jobs line, and we cannot let this opportunity slip by. Let's work together to build the red line now. And we are creating jobs in our city for residents. Since I came into office, our city's unemployment rate has declined by a third. And during those five years, the number of jobs in our city has increased by more than 12,000. Just look at the remarkable progress we've made in just the past few months. The hiring fair for new Am the new Amazon Distribution Center drew huge numbers of applicants. Companies such as Pandora, Mafe, Vaccinogen have announced that they are moving their headquarters and their jobs from the suburbs into our city. The Horseshoe Casino, which opened last summer, exceeded its local hiring commitment, providing more than 1,300 new jobs to Baltimore City residents. <laughs> Meanwhile, a number of our existing companies are staying and growing in Baltimore. You know about Under Armour's success and their proposed expansion, but you might not know about the investment firm Stiefel Nicholas choosing to stay in the Central Business District, or Peg Software announcing its plans to more than double its workforce, or biotech firm Emergent Biosolutions doubling the size of its manufacturing facility on Lombard Street with plans to add an additional 158 jobs in Baltimore. These companies and many others are evidence that Baltimore is a great investment. But as we continue to build an environment in which job creators can grow, we still recognize that too many of our citizens are being left behind. That's why I hired Jason Perkins Cohen to serve as my new director of the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. Welcome, Jason. Jason brings... Jason brings a tremendous record of advocacy and results, connecting our hardest to employ with jobs that they need. I want to create job opportunities for all of our citizens, not just those with college degrees. That's why when I learned the Magna Center was closing, Senator, Senator <laughs> Councilwoman Middleton, I was determined to find a way to continue providing manufacturing skills training so that our citizens could provide for their families. This spring, I am very proud to announce that we will be opening the new Regional Skills Training Center in Park Heights. This center will offer advanced manufacturing skills through JARC, a nationally recognized not-for-profit organization. And let's not forget that growing Baltimore also means nurturing small business. 
I've repeatedly said that my goal is to establish Baltimore as a destination for entrepreneurship, a place where small, local, and minority-owned businesses can start and grow. Earlier this year, I eliminated and reduced many of the minor privilege fees charged to our small businesses in order to extend our capacity to reach even more entrepreneurs, I propose doubling the funding of our Small Business Resource Center in next year's budget. <laughs> Many new business owners tell us that the early support that they received at our center was critical to their success. This would allow us to create a more robust portfolio of services and expand our outreach directly to neighborhood businesses. Two years ago, we launched the city's first microloan program, and we are already seeing tremendous results. Our Baltimore Micro Program has closed on 21 microloans that triggered more than $1.9 million in capital investment, generated 106 new jobs, and supported 130 existing jobs. Even better, more than half of the loans were provided to minority or women-owned businesses. And we're doing even more. Today, I am releasing my strategic plan for small business and entrepreneurship growth in Baltimore. The plan contains 20 specific action items to increase resources for small businesses, to cultivate the innovation economy, to promote an inclusive economy, and make Baltimore more business friendly. These actions include launching a new online entrepreneurship resource network and establishing a $1 million innovation fund to help small businesses and medium-sized businesses adapt to the latest technology. All of these initiatives align perfectly with the city's comprehensive economic development strategy, recently published by the Baltimore Development Corporation. This is the first time in recent history that BDC has undertaken a strategic planning process for our city's long-term economic objectives. This comprehensive strategy will focus our efforts on key growth sectors of our economy, while also devoting more attention to empty storefronts and vacant, build vacant buildings in our communities. I know BDC President, your former colleague, the CEO, Bill Cole, is up to the task He is up to the task of implementing these plans in a way that benefits all of Baltimore's neighborhoods and creates, and, and do it in a way that creates new economic opportunities for our residents. So all across the city, new projects are emerging in our neighborhoods from Coppin Heights to Barclay, from Sharp Leaden Hall to Remington, and as a result of my apartment tax credit, more than 3,200 new apartments are now under construction. Just drive through our neighborhoods and you will see the progress that we are creating all over Baltimore City. I want to be able to highlight what's happening in Baltimore and what's coming to your neighborhoods. This week, we are rolling out a new online system, EconView. This tool provides a new way for citizens, our business owners, and potential new residents and investors to gain a better picture of what is being planned and built and developed in their neighborhoods. I can't wait for you to see it. And this year, we will mark the five-year anniversary. When's the party, Paul? The five-year anniversary of our Vacants to Value program. It is an internationally recognized effort that is making a real difference in communities all across our city. I'm particularly proud of how we've leveraged more than $107 million in private investment. Together, we are winning back neighborhoods that were at the tipping point, block by block. Thousands of vacant homes have been demolished or rehabbed so far. And while we're creating housing opportunities for new residents, we're also demonstrating a commitment to those who grew up here. We want to improve your neighborhoods and keep you in the city. Just ask longtime residents like Ms. Janice Jacobs, thank you for being here, 
who is the president of the Ashland Avenue Association. Just ask her how vacancy value has impacted her neighborhood. She describes blocks that were once pocketed with vacant homes, now coming back to life with new investment and new homeowners. I want to thank you for being here, and thank you for believing in Baltimore and for all that you do to make our city stronger. <laughs> Baltimore has been internationally recognized as a welcoming city with immigrants moving into our neighborhoods and creating thriving communities. Last year, I created the Mayor's Office of Immigrant and Multicultural Affairs and released the report, The Role of Immigrants in Growing Baltimore. This report was one of few in the country highlighting the importance of retaining and attracting immigrants. We are now implementing the 32 recommendations laid out in that report to further strengthen Baltimore as a place of economic opportunity and inclusion. To these new families, I say, welcome, and please tell us how we can help. <laughs> Together, we are growing Baltimore by building on our strengths and creating new ones. And in doing so, we must celebrate our history, our diversity, and our creativity. Just look at the successful events we've had over the past year. The Star Spangled Celebration, the Army-Navy game, Artscape, the African American Festival, the Orioles in the postseason, the playoff run by the Ravens, we will miss you, Tori Smith. And the list goes on and on. For this year, we have booked a record 29 citywide conventions expected to draw. We can clap for that. I know that's <laughs> visit Baltimore. This is a record booking year for them. They're expected to draw more than 200,000 attendees and generate over $140 million in economic impact. I'm also very excited for the unique art projects that our newly announced Light City Baltimore Festival will bring us in 2016. All of these events highlight the vibrancy of our growing city. All of this is to say that the state of our city is strong. We are growing Baltimore, and I plan to keep that momentum going. We are building on a strong fiscal foundation. We're making Baltimore safer. We're restoring public trust in government. We're building new recreation centers and new schools. We're ensuring our children are healthy. We're creating more jobs and economic activity. We're growing small businesses and promoting entrepreneurship. We're taking back our vacant properties one by one and making our communities stronger. We're celebrating in Baltimore with our arts, our culture, conventions, and sports. This is the city that we all love. We all know it's the city that others fall in love with, a city with heart and soul to be better every day, a city with pride, a growing city. And I am so proud to have led this effort for the past five years. And I am excited to make Baltimore each better, each and every day. Together, we can and we will grow Baltimore. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless Baltimore. As we reflect on the mayor's words, I ask that Dr. Todd Yeary, senior pastor of Douglas Memorial Community Church, come forward and lead us in the benediction. Shall we pray? God of grace and God of glory, we've gathered this afternoon with a deep sense of gratitude for the gift of life. We have heard from your servant, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake, as she has shared with the people the state of the city of Baltimore. 
Bless her with wisdom, passion, and the courage to continue to speak to the urgent and pressing needs of the whole city. Grant the members of this council the gift of your presence and the reassurance of your voice. Speak to all of them in clear ways that remind them to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thee. We, citizens and servant leaders, recommit ourselves to making the city of Baltimore better, more vibrant, and more just. Help us to see our greatest needs and our greatest possibilities. Cause us to hear and understand the concerns of all people. Allow us to feel the deep yearnings of all who desire to live with dignity and creative purpose. God, you have been our help and our hope in ages past. Now be our guide and our keeper in the days that are now upon us. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Grant us wisdom and grant us courage for the facing of these days. In the mystery and the majesty of your holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Yuri, for the uh, benediction. Uh, we will, I'm going to ask everyone to please remain standing while the chief clerk escorts the mayor out of the chambers. I ask everybody to stay in their places. This meeting of the Baltimore City Council Committee of the Whole is adjourned. Thank you.